So now that we've talked about transformations and their algebraic form and how they affect the graphical form, let's work backwards and start with the graphical form of a function and see what are the transformations happening to that function. Try to come up with what the actual function equation is. So first off, we want to identify what is the parent function or the general shape of this function. On this first one, this is in the grayed outline. This is the original parent function, and the black is the function after having some transformations applied to it. So then the grayed out is the absolute value function. So the parent function is the absolute value function. That won't come into play until the end when, when we're just rewriting the function itself. So for the transformations, again, we want to be careful of the order of operations. So we want to work with the inside first deal with the horizontal shifting so a good reference point is that base that bottom or vertex of the v on the absolute value function and see how that point is being shifted or moved so we start at zero zero and then the point is being shifted horizontally to the right by two so let's write that transformation out in words so we go right two and what that looks like algebraically, remember, we're shifting to the right two. So that's a horizontal shift. We're dealing with the input or the inside of the function. And since it's right two, it is subtracting two on the inside on the input. So what this looks like algebraically is y equals f of x minus two. And this is just the general way to write it without even dealing with the parent function, just what the algebraic operation or transformation is. And we can draw that by just shifting the original function to the right two, so that vertex is going to be right here at the point two zero. And we can just sketch or dot out what the new function is going to look like. So this is what the function looks like after the first transformation. And the next transformation we're dealing with now, there's nothing else on the inside to work with. There's no horizontal reflections or reflections over the y-axis. So next we're dealing with the outside of the function. And then with the outside of the function, regular order of operations, we deal with the multiplications first, so which is the stretching or any reflections over the x-axis. So here, since there is a flipping, there is some sort of reflection going on. And what it's doing is it's reflecting over the x-axis. So it's making all the y values negative. So if we have a, the point 3, 1, that becomes the point 3, negative 1, because you make the y value negative. So here, the next transformation is a reflection over x-axis. And what that transformation looks like algebraically is you're applying a negative to all the y values. So we put a negative in front of the f of x. So we have y equals negative out front, f of, that input stays the same, x minus two. And we can graph that out by just flipping or reflecting over that x-axis from one to get the new function here. So after two transformations, this is what we look like. And then the last transformation it's almost right where the ending graph is, but the only difference is that we just need to shift up by one. So that shift up one is adding one to the output. So we're adding one on the outside here. So the third and last step is a shift up by one. And what that looks like algebraically is we have all the transformations so far, so the negative on the outside, f of on the input, x minus two, and then now we're shifting up by one, so we're adding one to the outside here. And so keeping in mind what the parent function is, we can now bring in what the function looks like with all the transformations, and then with the parent function, we have the new function, the function in the black is negative on the outside, and then the function itself is absolute value of x, so absolute value of x, but we're changing the input to x minus 2, and then on the outside we're adding 1. So this function that is graphed here in the black should be negative absolute value of x minus 2 plus 1.
And then for the next function, we see the parent or base function in the gray and then the new function in the black. We wanna figure out what is the equation of that new function. So in the gray, this is the squaring function or the x squared function. So we have the parent is x squared. And then the transformations, we want to first, again, look at any horizontal shifting. So any shifts left or right. And we can use, again, the vertex as sort of a reference point to identify the shifting or maybe some of the reflections. So if we look at where the vertex shifts to, so starting at 0, 0, it shifts to the left by 2. So that's how we would describe the transformation in words is left 2. And what the transformation actually looks like in terms of the algebraic form is y equals, it's a horizontal shifting, so it goes on the input, so f of x, and then it's going left to, so you add 2 to the input. And what that looks like, we'll sketch it out. So shifting left to, you have this point right here is now that new vertex. And then you're sort of just sketching up. We're not going to make it too exact, but just to get a general idea. So this is what the function looks like after that first step. And then next we want to see, are there any reflections over the y-axis? There's not any reflections over the y-axis, so we don't have to deal with anything else on the input on the inside. So the next we want to work with or deal with anything on the outside. And if we look on stuff on the outside, we first have any multiplications or reflections over the x-axis. So anything out front that's multiplying. And then we also have any shifts up and down. So order of operations, we deal with the multiplications, the stretches or the reflections first. And there actually is a stretching going on here. So the way we can identify that is if we look at the original function. So the original function has, if you start at the middle, at the vertex right here, when you go right one, you go up one. That's always the case for this parent function x squared. If you plug in one as the value as the input, you square that, you get one out. So if you go right one, you go up one. On this new one here, when we, it's a little bit hard to see because it's a little bolded, but if we zoom in a little bit, but on the new graph, if we look at what that shifting is, we start at the vertex and when we go right one, we can count up to see what that new height is. So we go up one, two, three, and it hits the point up here. So it has this new height of three. So it has that same horizontal distance. So when you go right one, instead of going just up one, you're now going up three. So we're stretching or multiplying the y values or the heights by a factor of three. So this is a vertical stretch by three. So let's write that out and talk about what it looks like algebraically. So step two is we do a vertical stretch by three. And what that looks like is, so we take the previous expression, the y equals f of in the input x plus two, and we're now stretching the y values, we're multiplying the y values by three. So what that looks like is y equals three on the outside and it's multiplying the f of x plus two. f of x plus two, those are the outputs. So we're multiplying the outputs on the outside by three. So that means we have this, and I'm not gonna be super particular with how we graph this because it can get a little messy, but essentially what's happening is we're just stretching up here. And so this is the second graph. You shift to the left by two, and then you multiply all the y values by three, and that causes that stretching. So going from the second graph we drew, the two after we shift to the left and we do the stretching, the last thing to do is just the shifting down. And so that shifting down is if we count one, two, three. So we shift down by three. And a shifting down by three, all you're doing is subtracting the y values by three. So we just include a minus three on the outside because on the outside is when you're affecting the outputs. So the new 
function, what it looks like with all the transformations is y equals three times f of on the input x plus two minus three on the outside. So now taking account what the parent function actually is, remember when we say parent function, this is like the f of x part. Same thing with the absolute value one. This was the f of x. So when we write f of x plus two, the f of x is the x squared function. So x plus two is the new input. And then on the outside, you're multiplying by three and subtracting by three. So let's write that out and see what it looks like. So we have y equals three on the outside, multiplying the squaring function. So on the inside of the squaring function, that new input is x plus two squared. That's what the function is, the squaring minus three on the outside. So that's the equation for this function. So then for the third function here on the bottom left, the parent or base function is in the gray. This is the cubing function. So that parent function is x cubed. Remember, this is what we would call f of x. And the transformations, we always want to identify the horizontal left and right shifting first. So we you can again use this middle or origin point as our point of reference to see what the shifting is. So if we look at where that reference point is on the new graph, this is actually shifted if we count one, two, three to the left. So we do a shift left three. And we do a shift left by three. This is y equals f of, and we're affecting the inputs x and it's going left so it's plus three so just as a reference what this looks like is y equals in reference to the parent function x plus three cubed and so when we shift left by three this is what it looks like we go one two three to the left and then we sketch out the parent or original function so this was the first step. And then the next one is to see if there are any reflections or multiplying going on on the outside. So on the outside here, or affecting the, the y's, it doesn't look like there's any stretching. Because if we look at the original parent function, when you go right one, you go up one. Same thing on the new function, when you go right one, well, you actually go down one. But if we're talking about just the distances themselves, there's no stretching going on. But there is a reflecting going on. So let's take a look at the reflecting happening here. So with this reflecting, we can actually describe it using a horizontal reflection or reflection over the y-axis or a vertical reflection or reflection over the x-axis. If we do it as a reflection over the y-axis, we get the correct shape that we want, but then we'd have to adjust what our shifting is because then we'd have to shift again. So let's describe this using a vertical reflection. So with a vertical reflection, that's saying we're making all the y values negative. So we look at this point on here, negative two, one, when we do that vertical reflection over the x-axis, we're making the y values negative. So that new point is now negative two, negative one. So we're just flipping or reflecting, making all the y values negative. And all the negative y values become positive. So let's write that as the next step of the transformation. We're doing a reflection over the x-axis. And so what that looks like, we've done this before, you just make a negative out front of the f of x function. So negative f of x plus three. And so what this lo actually looks like in terms of the cubing function, this is y is, y is equal to negative on the outside x plus three cubed. And so what it looks like in the graph when we make that reflection over the x-axis, it's now flipped. So all the y values that are positive become negative and all the negative y values become positive. So you have these new points over here that are just flipping. So in the dotted is what the second transformation would look like. And now lastly, so we're going from the second transformation to the black and all we have to do is just to shift down by two. So this last step here is down two. 
and that down two, all we're doing is just subtracting two on the outside. So this is y is equal to negative f of x plus three. That's what we had, and then we subtract two on the outside. And so what this finally looks like is negative. The function is the cubing function, so negative on the outside. On the inside is x plus three. The cubing function is, well, put a cube or a three in the exponent, and then you subtract two on the outside. And then for this last transformation, we have again the absolute value function as the parent function. And then let's take a look at first, what are the horizontal shiftings here? So we first do a shift looking at the vertex, we go one, two, three, four to the right. So the first step is shift right four. And that looks like y equals f of, it's on the inside, x minus four. And then when we shift right four to sketch that, it looks something like this. And then now we want to look and see what's happening on the outside. So on the outside, we have a couple things happening. So first we deal with multiplication, which multiplication is describing the vertical reflections and also the vertical stretches or compressions. So we have here both a vertical reflection and a vertical stretching or compressing. So let's first say we have a vertical reflection. So first is reflect over x axis, which to do that algebraically, we just put a negative out front of the f of x, the outputs. So this is what it looks like now after we do the reflection over the x axis. And then we can look at the points in the y values of how they're being stretched or compressed. So normally on the parent or original function, when you go, we'll talk about left, so we have space over here. When you go left two, so we go left two here, the height that we go is two. So left two means we go up two, or a measure of two horizontally corresponds to a measure of two vertically. If we look at the new function here, when we go left two, we only go down one. So when we go left two, we go down one. So that height is now being scaled and it's always being scaled by a, a multiplying factor. So we wanna ask ourselves, what do we multiply two by to get to one? Well, you multiply two by one half if you wanna to get to one. So this is in fact a vertical compression because we're making it flatter. Rather than making the Y values bigger, the Y values are becoming smaller. And it's a vertical compression by one half. So let's write that three is a vertical compression by one half. You could also say it's a vertical compression by 0.5, same thing. So let's write that out. This is saying that we're multiplying all the outputs or the Y values by one half. So we have Y equals negative is still there, but it's negative one half now on the outside. And then we have F of x minus four on the inside. So combining two and three into one picture, we're doing this compression and this reflection. So to graph out or to sketch out the new function or graph after three steps, it looks like this. So this is what the graph looks like on the third step. Kind of have to cut it off on the right hand side here. And then lastly, the last step that we do is now just a shifting down by two. And that shifting down by two looks like y equals, we have all the stuff already happening here. So negative one half out front times the output f and then within the input is x minus four, and then shift down by two, we're subtracting two to all the y values. So taking into account what the parent function actually is, which is the absolute value function, we can write this final function equation as y equals negative one half out front, and then the function itself is the absolute value function. The input of that function is x minus four, and the output 
we subtract it by 2 at the end. So with those previous examples, we actually had parent functions that we've talked about before, but we might not have parent functions that we've talked about before exactly. Like this function on the right here, f of x, is sort of just made up kind of like a piecewise function where it's just different lines defined at different points. And so let's take a look at the domain, the range, increasing, decreasing intervals, and see how those are affected by just being given or looking at the new function which we have here with all the transformations. And we'll see how points change individually. So the domain of this function originally is from negative 5 to 6 because we go left 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the left. So that's the farthest left it goes is negative 5. And if you count to the right, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to the right. So the domain here is negative 5 to 6. And we use brackets because those values are actually included in the domain. And then the range, the lowest we go is 1, 2. So we go to negative 2. And the highest we go, if we count up, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's that highest point up there. So the range is negative 2 to 6. And again, we use the brackets because we're including those points. And then intervals of increasing and decreasing. Remember, we always describe decreasing, increasing, and constant using the x values, and we always use parentheses. So looking at the graph left to right, it's increasing from this far left point all the way up to this point over here. So looking at the x values, that far left is negative 5 x value. So it's increasing at the start, negative 5 to the new x value of the point where it stops increasing. If we count, that's left 1, 2. So that's negative 2. Two. These are the x values where it's increasing. And then following the graph from negative 2, it starts decreasing, and it's decreasing all the way to the x value of 3. So it's decreasing from negative 2 to 3. And then lastly, on that last leg, it's increasing. So start back up at 3 x value, and it's increasing to the x value of 1, 2, 3. Count up, so that's 6 because right, we already counted three, so this x value of that final point is six. So that's the increasing interval. We use a union, and we're going from three to six. And there's no constant intervals on this graph. So now let's take a look at the g of x function, which is a function that has all these transformations happening to the original f of x function use regular the order of operations that we're talking about first so horizontal shifting first that's on the inside we have x minus one the minus one means we go to the right by one and then on the outside follow regular order of operations we do multiplying first so that 0 0.5 is multiplying and since 0 0.5 makes values smaller it is a compression it's a value that's between zero and one so this is a vertical compression by 0 0.5. And lastly, in terms of order of operation, we have the adding of the two on the outside. So it's on the outside, it's affecting the y values of the outputs, and it's adding two to all of them. So that shifts them all up by two. So this is a shift up two. So now let's write out what each of these individual points are and see how they're affected. So the points on the original function, if we look at this farthest left point, this is the point negative 5, negative 2. The next defined point is negative 2 and 4, if we count up to that height. The next defined point is to the right 3, and then height of 0, and that last defined point is to the right 6, and height of 6. So let's list all those order pairs out and see how they're all affected. So the first one is negative 5, negative 2. Next is negative 2, 4. Next is 3, 0. And then last is 6, 6. So the first step that we do in the transformations is we go right 1. So if you're shifting a graph or shifting the points to the right one, 
you're affecting the x values and what you're actually affecting is you're making the x values bigger by one you're adding one to the x values because when you go to the right one you're making the x values one bigger so to go to do that first step here we take the original point the x and the y but we're adding one to the x so to get the new points we just do x plus one that's that shifting right by one so all the new points here are add one to the x values negative four negative two the next one here is negative one four the third one is four zero and the last is seven six and the next step is a, that vertical compression by 0 0.5 so what we're doing is we're multiplying all the y values by 0 0.5 or we're essentially dividing all the y values in half so we have now to go from step one to step two we keep the x value the same nothing's being affected there and we multiply the y values by 0.5 or we divide them in half. So divide the y value in half on the first point, that becomes negative one. So x stays the same, negative four, y value is now negative one. On the next point, it's negative one, and then divide by two in the y value, that's two. And then the next one is four, zero, because divide zero by two and you still get zero. And the next one is seven and three. And then the last step is shifting up by two. So when you shift up by two, you're adding two to all the y values. So to get the new point on the last step from the previous step, you add two to the y values. So x values all stay the same. And then you just add two to the y values. So negative four, one, negative one, four, four, two, and lastly, seven, five. So let's plot out, these are the final points that we are looking at on this new function or on this new graph, the g of x function. So negative four, one is right here. And the next point is negative one, four. And that's right. And that's right here, negative one, four. The next point is four, two. That's right here. And the last point is seven, five, and that's right here. So we connect the dots and this is our new G of X function. After performing all of those transformations. So this last page is a little bit of an extra aside to describe or talk about why some of these transformations algebraically affect the graphs in the way that they do graphically. So looking at the horizontal shifting, this one I think is the less intuitive out of all the other ones. All the other ones are pretty intuitive, but here with the horizontal shifting, it kind of does the opposite. When you add two on the inside, you're shifting to the left, but you would expect to shift to the right. When you're subtracting, say, three on the inside, you're shifting to the right, but you'd expect to shift to the left because you're subtracting by three. So let's take a look at how that works. So for the regular y equals x squared function, the squaring function, we have all of these inputs listed out from negative five to seven. And then we have all the outputs when you square all those values, 24, 16, nine, four, et cetera. And then when we have x plus two squared, we have these outputs now. When you plug in negative five, you get three on the inside you get negative three on the inside and you square that and that's positive nine. Same thing, plug negative four in, you get negative two on the inside, square that, that's four. And so we can see that the outputs are very similar, but they're just offset by a little. We can see here we have nine and nine match up. We can see that we have four and four match up, one and one match up, zero and zero match up. So we have these matching of the outputs. And in the table, what's happening is from the original function, you have the output of nine at the input of negative three, but then you have the output of nine at the input of negative five. So if you look on the table, what's happening is those outputs are being shifted or we have to use an X value that is two less. So from negative three to negative five, that's a shift down or shift left by two.
So in order to get the same output, the idea is that you have to decrease your input, in this case, by two. And so there's this shifting left by two that's happening in the table. In order to get that same output, you need to adjust what that input is. And it's the same idea with the x minus three, you would just end up shifting to the right by three to get those same outputs. For example, in order to get the output of zero on this function, you would have to plug in three to get zero squared, which is zero. And so this is shifting. If you look at the original outputs, it's going from the input of zero to the input of three to get that same output. So that's a shift right by three. So that's how those shifting left and rights work and why it works is because you have to adjust the inputs to get the same outputs. However, on the outside of the functions, what's really happening is that you are affecting or adjusting the outputs after they already happen. So you apply the function itself, you get some output out, and then when you say multiply by two on the outside or add two on the outside, the order of operation tells us that we need to do the multiplying or the adding on the outside of the function second or after we do the actual function operation, right? Because we do the squaring before we do the multiplying. So the multiplying by two here is after the fact, after you've already used the squaring function itself. So looking at the regular inputs of the squaring function, negative two all the way up to positive two, and then you have four, one, zero, one, four, those are the outputs. And if you look at the outputs here, order of operation tells us to do, if we're plugging in negative two, do negative two squared, right? So we have two times negative two squared. Order of operation tells us to do the negative two squared first. So this is four, and then you multiply that by two, it's eight. So the multiplying and the adding are all after the fact, rather than with the shifting of the x's, those are all before you actually evaluate the function. And then lastly, we had listed out on our table some of the multiplying on the inside. And multiplying or multiplication on the inside of functions can always be translated to multiplications on the outside. So that's why I skipped in saying or describing any multiplications on the inside. Because it can always be transferred or translated to some stretching or compressing on the outside. So for example, if we have the parent function square root of x, we can rewrite square root of 4x by applying the square root to both parts. Remember, you can spread out or apply a square root between multiplications. So this is really the same thing as square root of 4 times square root of x, which is 2 times square root of x. So this is now, instead of becoming multiplying on the inside, it's now multiplying on the outside, which we, we've talked about in terms of the vertical stretching and compressing. Same thing here, we can write this as the square root of 0.25 times the square root of x. And if you put the square root of 0.25 in the calculator, you should get that that is 0.5 and then times the square root of x. So it's always able to translate or to shift from multiplying on the inside to multiplying on the outside if we're just using the actual function itself. And that's where we'll end it for this lesson.